Hey everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. Welcome to my kitchen. I'm really happy to have you here with me today where we are going to do one of my favorite things and that is a bulk canning day. We are going to preserve close to 500 pounds of tomatoes for are all of our tomato needs for the entire year. My husband, Dan, is going to be helping with canning today and he wants to try to get it all done in one day. I told him that was fairly ambitious. Usually it'll take me at least a day and a half to get this much uh, preserving done, but that's his goal, so we are going to give it our best shot to do that. One of the reasons that I love bulk canning like this is because while it is a lot of work for a day or two, it is so satisfying to have enough of whatever product I'm preserving to last my family for an entire year. I am someone who absolutely loves to can. There are lots of amazing other ways to preserve food, and I'll be showing you a few of those today. We are gonna do a little freeze drying and a little dehydrating as well, but canning is something that I have done just about my entire life. My first memory of canning is probably when I was about maybe seven or eight years old, um, chopping up peaches while my mom canned in the kitchen. And my mom was very much about teaching us um, all the skills that she knew. So we learned how to can when we were really young and I started independently canning when I was probably around 19, 20 or so. So I've been canning for a very long time and I have never gotten tired of it. I have packed almost everything that I have learned over all of those years into a canning guide and it's absolutely free for you. You can get it down in the show notes below or in the pinned comment. If you remember back in May, I did a live Zoom call that you could register for and it was so much fun to be able to meet with you face to face and be able to answer your questions and we did a canning Q&A. So I have decided to do another one in September and in order for me to find out what kind of questions you would like to have answered, we've put together a survey in the pinned comment down below that you can click on. There's only three questions but it will just give me a really good idea of the topics that we can cover during that Zoom call. As part of filling out that survey, you are going to have the opportunity to enter a giveaway for a starter canning kit. So this is gonna have a water bath canner. It's going to have all the things that you need to get started with canning. And if you'd like to fill out the survey and participate in the Zoom call, you can fill out the survey and just opt out at the bottom from the giveaway if you already have the things that you need for canning. But if you would like to enter that giveaway, you can just click the um, little checkbox at the bottom to let me know that you want to enter that. We'll make sure that we let you know here on the channel who won that giveaway probably in a couple weeks time. Okay, without further ado, let's get into this canning since we have a lot of canning to do. So the number one piece of advice that I can give you is to really thoroughly plan out your canning day. So not just plan out what you're gonna be canning, make sure you have all the ingredients you need and all the equipment you need and all of that, but also what you're gonna be eating that day. Because as you can see, my kitchen is already starting to fill up with canning paraphernalia. It's going to get increasingly messy and cluttered in here as the day progresses. So planning some simple food for the day can really, really help. If you've been here for a while, you know that I almost never wear shoes in my house. We are a take your shoes off at the front door household, but when it comes to canning day, I always put on a good pair of shoes because I know I'm gonna be on my feet all day long and I want to make sure that I am comfortable, that my back and my feet don't end up hurting by the end of the day, although they probably will anyway. Um, but the other thing is, is one of my pet peeves is walking on a sticky floor with socked feet. It's just, uh, or stepping on something that fell on the floor or anything like that. And that is pretty much a guarantee when you're doing a canning day like this. There's gonna be a piece of tomato that lands on the floor or it's just gonna increasingly get sticky as the day progresses. So I much prefer to have shoes on. The other thing is to try to pick something to wear that I don't mind ruining uh, because I am guaranteed to get food on it and probably stain whatever it is I'm wearing. And the other thing of course is to get everything organized and this I find best to do the night before so I'll show you what we've done in preparation for canning we have the dishwasher full of canning jars over there we have washed canning jars over here waiting to be filled I also have my tomato machine set up over here and this is for removing the seeds and the skin for making tomato sauce. It is fantastic. This was gifted to me by a subscriber last summer I think or maybe the summer before and it is just an amazing tool. I am going to be both water bath canning my tomatoes and pressure canning my tomatoes today and running five canners. So I have two pressure canners sitting here, just traditional pressure canners. Over here, I have my Presto electric pressure canner. And then outside over there, I have two water bath canners. 
When we calculated it last night, it was around 34 quarts that we can do all at once in kind of one batch throughout all of these canners. So that's probably the main reason why we can can so much at once is by running multiple canners this way. The other thing that you need if you're running multiple canners like this is separate timers for each canner because even if you're using two of the identical canners, they're gonna heat up just slightly differently and timing is really important when it comes to safe canning. So make sure that you have enough timers to accommodate however many uh, canners you're using is get some tomatoes going in my roaster ovens over here. So we are going to get those run through the tomato machine to remove the skins and the seeds and turn those into simple tomato sauce. And then I will be refilling these canners with a mix of, this, of the um, farm bought tomatoes and my own tomatoes to make pizza sauce. I love using a mix of my heirloom tomatoes for making pizza sauce because it just makes the best pizza sauce. So we'll be filling up these roaster ovens again with um, tomatoes as soon as we get these run through the tomato machine. I have my food processor set up over here with the chopping blade and I'm going to be doing eight trays for my freeze dryer. I just have a medium size Harvest Right freeze dryer with four trays, but I do have eight tra trays so that I can pre-freeze another um, four. I think I'm probably only gonna do that many just because the batches on the freeze dryer do take quite some time, probably 36 hours, I'm gonna guess, for tomatoes because they have a high moisture content. Um, but, if, but I actually did end up having to pull some tomatoes out that weren't entirely ripe, so I'll probably run those through the freeze dryer again once these loads are done. So I also have some tools ready to go. I have my tongs for lifting my jars out of my canners. I have some funnels for loading my tomatoes into my jars. And then of course, I also have my lids and my rings here, which I do need to get washed up. It is recommended to remove the skins of your tomatoes when you are canning your tomatoes. Uh, this has a couple of reasons. One is they say it's for safety in case that there may be any dirt or any contaminants on the outside of the tomato. I kind of question that a little bit just because we do things like peppers without peeling them and other vegetables in our canned products without peeling them. So that's not the reason I do it. The reason that I do it is because the skins can be a little bit tough when you can them without removing them and sometimes can impart a little bit of a bitter flavor. I don't find that to be as much of an issue when it comes to Roma tomatoes because the skins are quite thin on Roma tomatoes, at least the ones that I buy. But because I have the tomato machine, I'm just gonna be running all my tomatoes through there. That automatically removes the skins and the seeds. If you don't have a food mill, a tomato machine like I have, or another type of food mill for removing the skins and the seeds, you can actually just blanch your tomatoes for a couple of minutes in boiling water and put them right into hot water, or not hot water, cold water, preferably ice water to stop the cooking and then the tomato skins will peel right off. I know there's a lot of people that will put a, cut a little X into the bottom of the tomato to make the skins peel off easier. I have never done that and I they just peel right off without that extra step. So if you wanna save yourself a little extra time, don't put the cut in and just blanch them and they'll, it'll peel off fairly quickly. What I'm gonna do with my skins and my seeds this year is freeze dry them. You can also dehydrate them if you have a dehydrator. You can even dehydrate them in your oven on the absolute lowest setting. Just crack the door open a little bit so it doesn't get too hot in there. And then you can grind that up in your blender or your food processor and use that as tomato powder for flavoring, but also you can add a little water to it and make tomato paste with it. So that's what I'm gonna do with all my seeds and my skins this year. So here I am talking about all the prep that I do to have a really successful canning day, but in the interest of full transparency, I have a confession to make. Hi. <laughs> Speak of the devil, I was just about to talk about how with all my planning, I didn't plan quite well enough and you had to go to the store and get lemon juice for me. Uh, Dan just came back with my lemon juice. So anyway, normally I keep a fairly good stock of lemon juice and I use lemon juice to acidify my tomato products for safe canning and I'll get more into that in a couple of minutes. But anyway, I went down to my pantry to grab my lemon juice this morning and normally I have a large stock of all my canning supplies for the summer. And I have done quite a lot of canning already this year and I've apparently used all my lemon juice because I only had one jar left. So I do have citric acid, which you can also use for acidifying your tomato products um, as a backup. So I wouldn't have been stuck if Dan hadn't offered to run to the store for me and get lemon juice this morning, but he did. So he got the lemon juice. So now we have enough lemon juice. Okay, so now that we have run through all the prep for our canning today, we are going to get into it. 
All right, friends, we are ready to go. Dan is here with me in the kitchen. This is my husband, Dan, for those hey, of you that everyone. haven't met him before. So we are going to tag team the work here in the kitchen. Dan is gonna work over here in, with the uh, tomato machine. And this one, the brand is Fabio Leonardi, and it's an Italian um, tomato machine. It's amazing. I'll put a link down below for where you can get this in North America. I know you can get it in Canada. I'm sure you can get it in the States too. So I'll look up that information for you. So he's going to run through the tomatoes from the roaster ovens that we were cooking overnight. And then I'm going to go over to the other side of the kitchen and dice up all the tomatoes for the freeze dryer. The other thing that we're going to do today for fun. <laughs> what? <laughs> okay. We're going to try to stay serious for this video. Uh, that's going to be almost impossible to do with my husband though. <laughs> okay. Um, so these are pH strips and one of the other things that we're going to do today. What? <laughs> what? No, actually for real. I'm not trying to bug you. <laughs> you no, I wasn't. That wasn't intentional. I was bugging at me like this. Oh my goodness. Okay. Okay. So what are the other things that we are going to do? <sighs> Sorry. Okay. I'm just going to leave you alone to do your thing. <laughs> okay. I'll let you do your talking. Okay, so one of the other things that we're going to do is pH test our food. One of the things about canning tomatoes is that in order for you to bring up the acidity level of your tomatoes, you need to add some uh, lemon juice, like I talked about earlier, or some citric acid. And the reason for that is because tomatoes are kind of mid-range for safety, so they're usually around 1.6 on the pH scale, which is right borderline for safety, so we want to increase that acidity level a little bit to make them safer. Um, the reason that we do that is because botulism, which is kind of the big scary bacteria that we are all worried about when it comes to home canning, can't live in a high acid environment. So if we increase the acidity level of our canned products, then we don't have to worry about that. And of course, also processing them for the right length of time at the right temperature and all of that. But just out of curiosity, I wanted to check and see whether there was a difference between the commercially grown tomatoes that I am canning over here and my homegrown heirloom tomatoes, because I've always been told that heirloom tomatoes tend to be more acidic than uh, the tomatoes that are grown commercially today. So we're going to test that out and see if that's true. Even if the acidity level of these tomatoes does come in high enough, so with a low enough pH at 4.6 or lower, I'll still be adding the extra acid just because I don't personally mind the flavor of the uh, extra acid and it's just gonna guarantee that my product is safe, but I think this will be fun anyway. Okay, so what Dan's going to do is take all of the tomatoes out of our roaster oven with a slotted spoon because we don't want all of that extra water in there and run them through here. Um, and you can also roast your tomatoes in the oven. Um, just cut them in half, lay them down, and then roast them at 400 degrees just until they start to blister a little bit on the top. The skin peels off really easily when you do that, and then you get that nice roasted tomato flavor. That's a little too time consuming for the amount of tomatoes that we're doing today, so we're using the roaster ovens. I haven't run this through its paces yet, so one it thing it says to make sure that you do is put um, produce in it so it's not running dry. Have you plugged it in? I have plugged it in. That I think I have plugged in. <laughs> Let me double check. Last time I checked, there was not plugged in, but I wasn't sure if you needed it. Oh, it's not plugged in. All right. So yeah, try to let as much of that liquid drain over there as you can. All right. Mm-hmm. I definitely will be cooking it down significantly for making our pizza sauce, which is what we're gonna make with this batch. Okay, we have decided to run the tomatoes that are in here. We're just gonna go put them in a strainer so that they, we can drain out even more of the liquid because I would really rather not have to cook this down and have that extra step. So if straining it out is gonna be good enough, that would be perfect. Oh, I think that's gonna work awesome. Now I can get this cooking. Yeah, great idea. And then we can fill that up again. What I'm gonna do now, instead of chopping these ones that I just washed, and running them through the food processor, I'm gonna chop them up and fill up. That's okay. And fill up the roaster oven again, just so that we have that that going through 
again, it's crazy how much those or how much liquid came out of those, hey? Okay, I, you know what I wanna do here before I do that, get into the chopping, is let's pH test a little bit of these tomatoes. Okay, so that's what we have for color there. And... It's just like testing the antifreeze. So that, where would you say that's like right, probably there, hey? It's almost exactly. Yeah. Right so that puts it at, at what? Right at the end, I would say. Which is four point... Four and a half. Yeah, 4.5. So that is actually within what is considered safe because we want it below 4.6. So these are the commercial tomatoes. Now let's test one of my um, heirloom tomatoes and just see. Okay, so now we have the heirloom. And that one is maybe slightly lower. So it's kind of between 4.0 and 4.5. You can see there. So not a huge difference, but both within what's considered safe. So that's kind of interesting. You know what? If I had really good pH test strips or a pH tester specifically for food, these are just cheap ones off Amazon. So I'm, I, whoops, <laughs> so I don't wanna rely on them. But, um, and I tested each jar because each jar will have a slightly different uh, a pH level based on the type of tomatoes that went into it. But if I tested each jar and each jar came below 4.6 comfortably, I would feel okay with not adding extra acid to it. That being said, it's not that big of a deal just to add a couple tablespoons. It's two tablespoons to every quart of lemon juice. And I personally don't mind the flavor at all. My mom has always added lemon juice. So I've grown up with that in my tomatoes. Or you can just add citric acid if you don't like the lemon flavor in tomato products, just to guarantee without having to test every single batch. I think I'll probably just continue to do that, but it is an interesting um, experiment anyway. I have used these pH strips to test other things that I've been canning and everything has been within the safe realm. So kind of a fun thing to do. And these aren't really expensive if you wanna pick yourself up some and test your own canned goods. Got a good sharp knife for cutting these in half. If you don't have a good steel, this is what a steel looks like, I would highly recommend you get one. Um, because if you have dull knives, chances are you only need a steel to straighten the blade out. The steel doesn't actually sharpen it, but it does straighten the blade because they'll get little kind of, um, I don't know, like a ripple almost in the blade, which is what can make it feel really dull. And if you straighten that blade out, it's nice and sharp again. So definitely grab yourself a steel if you don't have one already. My butcher was telling me that knives should only really need to be sharpened. And you can imagine how much he uses his knives every six months to a year. So if you're feeling like your knives need to be sharpened, they might just need the blade straightened out. So all I'm doing is cutting off the end of these and then cutting them in half and then they'll go into the um, roaster oven again to cook down and then I'm going to get another batch washed up and get those run through here, put on my freeze dryer trays and then get them into the freeze dryer. Okay, so I'm at the point now where I can start running through some tomatoes through my food processor here. And I just wanted to show you the blade that I have on it because I always get asked about it. So this is a KitchenAid food processor and it has a blade that is a dicing blade. So there's a blade on the inside that spins and then it dices everything up, which is so fantastic. This thing saves me so much time. Um, this is just the regular KitchenAid food processor, but the kit, the one that Dan bought me came with this. So I'm not sure if you can buy this implement separately, but it's just called the dicing implement for KitchenAid. So you can look and see if you can find that. Cause I know a lot of people were wanting that. I do know the cuisine art one also has a dicing blade like this as well. So what we're going to do is just dice these up, get them onto our trays. perfectly diced up tomatoes. So 
So these reconstitute beautifully for making a tomato sauce or anything like that. Um, if I had about five freeze dryers, I could have them all run through. I honestly don't even know if I would can tomatoes because this sure saves a lot of work. So I'll use these ones that I'm freeze drying the same way, whoops, the same way that I would use uh, canned tomatoes. Actually, just have to reconstitute them with water. Okay, I have some trays here. These ones are just gonna go into the freezer and the freeze dryer is just doing its um, chamber cooling right now. And then I'll bring you down there and show you um, it all loaded up with the tomatoes when it's ready to go. So I just wanted to show you one of my black crim tomatoes. Isn't that beautiful? It's very difficult for me to grow really large tomatoes up here just because our season is so short, but the black crim always do really well. So um, I'm throwing all of the tomatoes from my high tunnel, all the heirloom tomatoes in with this pizza sauce that I'm making. And I'm actually going to run down to the high tunnel and I'll bring you with me to go and pick whatever tomatoes we have right down there. And then for those of you that are new here, I'll give you a peek of my garden. So I've loaded our trays into the freeze dryer and we press continue. And now it's going to freeze these. This is my freeze dryer room. It is an absolute disaster mess right now. <laughs> Look at that mess. Uh, just because I come down here, hustle, get things into bags, throw in a big pile here and then deal with it all at the end of the season. <laughs> So this is what I call my food forest over here. It's a permaculture forest garden and I love it so much. We're going to be harvesting a ton out of there this week. And then over on this side, we have my main vegetable garden. So that's the little greenhouse that I start all my seeds in and my starts in the spring. And then in behind that is where we're going to my high tunnel. We do have Lots and lots and lots of tomatoes in this high tunnel. I don't know if we actually have a ton that we're going to have to pick, to be honest, because a lot of these can just hang out here for another day. So I think I am going to pick everything that is almost ripe in here. Normally I just let my tomatoes vine ripen because we don't have a lot of bug pressure here, issues with blight or any of those kinds of things that seem to plague gardeners further south of us. But since I'm here, I may as well pull all these gorgeous tomatoes off. Sometimes you do run the risk of cracking when they start ripening like this, especially if you've done any recent watering or have had rain, which I have. I am so pleased with the high tunnel this year. It's just looking fantastic. Oh my goodness, look at this. Look, we have what looks to be fairly ripe melons, my friends. Oh my gosh. Okay, so that one was ripe because it just pulled right off. So that's what a friend of mine said who's grown these kinds of melons. This is a northern melon. Said that when they're ripe, they'll turn yellow like this and pull really easily off of the vine. Oh look, there's another one. There are tons of them in here, but I don't see any other ripe ones from the look of it. I do, I don't, that one's starting to ripen. I don't see any others. Oh, hang on. Yep, that one is too. That is an unexpected find. I'm very excited about that. Found a few cucumbers in there as well. We are gonna be doing a massive harvest on the garden in two days. I have so much that needs to be harvested out of there. It wasn't maybe the best timing to get all these tomatoes with so much coming out of my own garden, but we were driving through and it's a couple of hours from here. So we didn't, we wanted to save ourselves the trip back again. It's gonna make for a pretty crazy week, that's for sure. Alrighty, that should do us. I am so excited to try these. I'm so excited. Look at that. Oh my goodness, it smells amazing. Okay, hon, you have to come try. Cantaloupe. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. That's really good. <laughs> I'm so excited. It's delicious. Mm. It tastes exactly like honeydew. I have never had a freshly picked melon before in my life. Very juicy. <laughs> and it is absolutely delicious. I can't wait for the kids to try these. That's amazing. Okay. Very excited. So my plan is with all of the extra that we don't eat fresh, although I suspect we may just eat it all <laughs> fresh, everything that I grew, is I'm going to freeze dry it because apparently it's very good freeze dried. But in the meantime, we'll just eat this up fresh because it is so good. This is the one that we ran through without pre-cooking them and you can see how much water is in there. And then this is the one that was pre-cooked overnight and it is almost at the point now where I can add a little bit of tomato paste or tomato powder to it to thicken up a little bit more and add all the seasonings. So if you do have the time cooking them down first in the roaster oven um, is not a bad idea although Dan was pointing out probably the amount of time it takes to actually cook them down is equal because you still have to steam off the same level of liquid for both methods and then over here Wow, it's really, really bright out here. So I have two water bath canners here on the outdoor burner that are all filled up. Do you wanna add at least an inch and a half to two inches of water over top of your um, jars in a water bath canner? And you don't start your timer until your canner is at a rolling boil, which I'll show you what that looks like in a minute. This is gonna be there fairly soon. It's starting to boil a little bit. And then you set your timer. So, so these tomatoes we are gonna can for 45 minutes in the water bath canner and for 15 minutes in the pressure canner. And I have a batch on um, or in my pressure canner inside in the electric pressure canner right now. So I'm gonna put the lids on just so that these can heat up a little faster. So here we go. That is what you want. That is a rolling boil. So you have two methods when it comes to canning tomatoes. You can do hot packing or cold packing. So cold packing means that you put the product in the jar cold, you put it into a canner with cold water, and then you heat everything up at the same time. I prefer to hot pack when I am doing things in a water bath canner so that I don't have to cool off my water between batches. So with the stewed tomatoes, we just heat them up so that they're stewed a little bit, so they're heated through, and then pack them in the jars and put them in the hot canner. It's just a much faster when you're doing multiple batches. If you are going to do hot packing, make sure that your jars are warm as well when you put your hot product in your jars so that you don't end up with cracking. Basically the rule of thumb for canning is you want everything to be the same temperature. Okay, so if your jars are cold, you want the product going in cold, you want the water those are going into to be cold or warm. You just don't want it to be hot so that there's not an extreme change in temperature. Um, and that will help you avoid cracking your jars. So we are about halfway through the tomatoes. What time is it right now? It's noon. So we might actually get these all done by the end of the day. That's exciting. So we'll keep you updated. Okay, so at this point we have all the canners full. So both pressure canners on the stove, the electric pressure canner and both of the water bath canners out there. And I think that's somewhere around 38 quarts. So we're gonna stop now, stop doing the canning part anyway, and just clean up the kitchen so that we can start the next round from a clean place. Cause otherwise I personally find it starts getting really overwhelming when the mess gets like this. So we're gonna do that. We'll be back with you probably when we're done the next round and then I'll walk you through step by step how to get all of these jarred up and into the canners. So I was talking about hot packing earlier and another one of the benefits of hot packing is because at least with tomatoes is tomatoes have a lot of liquid in them and it brings the liquid out and then you don't need to add extra water to your canned products which just makes them taste more flavorful. So we're gonna put two tablespoons of lemon juice in each jar. I guess we don't need the funnel to do that, do we? And then you can also add a teaspoon of salt if you like. And then we're just going to fill up our jars and leave one inch of headspace. So headspace is the distance between your food, the product, whatever you're putting in your jar, and the top of your jar. And then we're going to take this and we're going to debubble it. And with diced tomatoes, I like to really, really vigorously debubble. So we get all the air out of there. Go to our next jar and do the same. So we are going to get these filled up and then I'm going to wash the rims off really well. You can use a little bit of vinegar for doing that. 
because um, that helps to take any sticky mess that might be around along the edge of your jar. And um, there's a couple of benefits to wiping off the edge of your jar. One is to get all the sticky bits off so that your lids seal nicely. But the other is if you are using secondhand jars, actually any jar, because even a jar right out of a box brand new could have a bit of a crack on the rim. And when you're running your finger with a cloth along the rim, you can usually feel if there's any bumps, imperfections, cracks, or anything like that in it. And if there is, you can still use those jars, not for canning, but for storing dry goods, which is usually what I do as long as the whatever, you know, is along the edge isn't going to hurt anybody if they're going to wash it or anything like that. So I'm going to do that. Then these are going to go in the canner. We're going to get our next round of canning into the canners. And I will be back with you when we are done and show you what we ended up with. Friends, I have had to change several times because it is so hot. It is 30 degrees outside right now. And um, do you remember back when I did my peach canning and it was 40 degrees that day, the hottest day we had all summer? Well, today is the hottest day that we have had for probably three or four weeks now at this point. But we had those tomatoes to can and that's just the way that it goes sometimes. So I have some more tomatoes diced up over here. I have a couple more bowls, but I'm gonna hang on on that because the pizza sauce has now thickened beautifully. Look at how beautiful and thick that pizza sauce is. And our other one over here is just about there. I have taken, I think three or four quarts of water out of this since it's been cooking down. Um, when you just leave it to sit here, the water sort of forms around the edge and you can easily ladle it off. So that'll probably give another hour, but I can definitely season this one up. All I'm going to be adding into this is a little bit of oregano. When you're adding herbs to anything that you're canning, you want to make sure you use dry herbs because fresh herbs tend to taste bitter when they're canned. This is garlic scape powder and I have a lot of it. so. I'm trying to use it up. So I'm just going to be seasoning this to taste. I'm not adding my lemon juice right into this because I don't want to have to measure it all out and then add the right ratio. So I'm actually just gonna add a tablespoon to each of my pint jars, which will work the same way. So now I'm just gonna give this a taste and see if we have enough seasonings in it. Look at how thick that is. That is good, but I do feel like it needs a little bit more of the garlic scapes. Garlic scapes don't taste nearly as strong as garlic powder does. And I think just a touch more of the oregano. You could open up a jar of this and throw it on some pasta if you wanted. It is really, really good. We make pizza once every week or two and usually do eight pizzas at a time. <laughs> so we need a lot of pizza sauce give this a little bit of salt around half a teaspoon or so and this is pickling salt so it doesn't have any additives which is really important when you're canning and then now we're gonna add a tablespoon of lemon juice for fun let's pH test this lemon juice Well, that one is definitely lower than the tomatoes, that's for sure. So that one is, let's see, about 1.5 on the pH scale. Goodness, it's time to clean everything up again and fill up our jars with our sauce. We're going to leave about three quarters of an inch of headspace on these ones. So Dan's going to go open up our pressure canners because they're down to zero now. And then he's going to leave them to sit in those canners for a few minutes, up to five, even 10 minutes, just so that they can cool down a little bit. Because if we go try to take them right out of that hot canner, the contrast of the cooler air against those hot jars will actually, he could potentially make them start siphoning, which means the liquid starts to come up out of the jars. I get a lot of questions about siphoning 
and 99% of the time it has to do with dramatic temperature changes. So now we're going to wipe off the rim. These are brand new jars, so I'm not expecting to find any cracks. I did find one on one of the jars with the diced tomatoes, though. Oh, that had a blowout. You had a blowout? Sure, what happened there? Oh, no. <laughs> Maybe I did. We had a little bit of a blowout here. Apparently, I didn't tighten that lid on quite tight enough. So when you put your lids on, you want them to be finger tight. So you use your fingertips. Tighten it just so it's tight with your fingers. You don't want to put your hand on there and really reef it on because you do want air to be able to release from inside of the jar during the canning process. But you do have to have it tight enough that it stays on while it's canning. That's for sure. I'm gonna load up my pressure canner with all of these. I'll be back with you at this point, I think, when we have all the rest of this canned up. Uh, we are up to 68. Quartz, I think something like that <laughs> so we were kind of thinking we'd hit around 150 um, give or take but we do have a couple of boxes probably around 40 pounds or so of tomatoes that weren't quite ripe enough so that so I'll leave them for a couple of days and then can those but we did have around 25 pounds of tomatoes from the high tunnel that I had collected yesterday including the ones that I got or collected today so what is that gonna give us pound-wise? So that'll give us around 375 uh, pounds of tomatoes processed today. I'm feeling pretty good about that. All right, friends, it is, are you gonna yawn? <laughs> Dan's yawning off camera. <laughs> it's 9 p.m., which is pretty much our bedtime anyway, but we just took the last batch out of the canner and we ended up with, what did you say it was? 141 jars. Yeah, so we have 141 jars. We have the freeze dryer full right now, plus four more trays to go into the freeze dryer. We have the dehydrator full. Um, and then we have two boxes. They're just about both full of tomatoes that weren't quite ripe yet. So I feel that was pretty good for one day's worth of work. So what did you think of doing a bulk canning day like that? It's a big job. <laughs> yeah, it's a big job. <laughs> She's got skills, had really good tools. It wasn't that bad. Yeah, it was just, it was just, it's just a lot of... For, for what you get out of it, it was for a day's work. It was yeah. pretty, pretty awesome. Because we started, I started at six o'clock this morning, just kind of getting everything all prepared. And then we didn't really start canning until around 9.30 this morning or so, and then just finishing at nine. So 12 to 14 hours or so worth of work. So my feet are definitely tired. I am ready for bed, but I feel very happy to have all of these beautiful jars of preserves to go into our pantry. I hope that you enjoyed spending this time with us and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye. Good night.